Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that engages us this morning is the Old Testament reading from Nehemiah chapter 8. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, this morning as we encounter your word, we pray that you would open our ears, that we may be attentive to your word, that it may open our eyes and our hearts to see Jesus again. Amen. Last November, I came across the following story of a woman anonymously named Lisa. Just this week, Lisa's son spotted a pair of young brothers on the street near their home in Bushwick. He turned to his mom with pleading eyes. When am I going to get a brother? The five-year-old kindergartner wants nothing more than a little brother with whom he can share his bedroom, go to soccer games, and support his beloved Boston Red Sox. Normally, Lisa, who has struggled with infertility issues for nine years, would shrug. But this time, she could dare to hope. The 37-year-old actress is so desperate to have another son, she is ready to trade her one female embryo, the last embryo she has remaining after multiple rounds of IVF, for a male embryo of a stranger. I'm doing this for my son, she said to the Post. My husband grew up with sisters and wants a boy too. This is the way we want to complete our family. So last Wednesday, Lisa took drastic action, sitting down at her computer and writing a message on Facebook. Hello, we have been trying to give my child a sibling for three years. We want to complete our family with a son. We have a great quality female embryo. Would you like to consider a trade? As I read this story, all I could do was weep. I wept for the little girl frozen in some laboratory whose parents didn't want her who would rather use her as currency to chase after their own desires. I wept for the parents who were struggling with infertility and spending tens of thousands of dollars trying to overcome this real challenge in their lives, turning to anyone who could offer them hope. I wept for a world that has such a distorted view of life and family that has become so far removed from God's design for his creation. I wept. And then my tears turned to anger. How can our world be this way? How is the definition of a human with a heartbeat still up for debate? I'm sure many of you can relate to these emotions as you encounter the life issues we see in our world. Things we were just seeing play out in New York City, the state of New York. Our hearts break and we can't help but cry out for justice. And as the people of, that God has called together by his life-giving gospel, his life-transforming baptismal waters... We are the ones that God sends to be advocates for life, to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, to be a people of hope. But before we gather the troops and march into battle, before we sit high on our horses and aim our weaponized truth at the problem, there are two scenes from Scripture that we need to see this morning. And the first comes from Nehemiah chapter 8. And all the people gathered 
as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. It was early in the fall, the first day of the seventh month, Rosh Hashanah, the high feast where Israel celebrated the gift of new life. Specifically, God creating a world that was teeming with life out of nothing. And crowning his creation by giving life to the very first humans, Adam and Eve. Even more reason to celebrate was that this was Israel's first Rosh Hashanah having returned from their exile in Babylon. After decades of slavery in a faraway land, they were finally home. Their city was almost finished. The wall of Jerusalem had finally been restored. And it, what, what had once been forgotten ruins was now teeming with life. There was so much reason to celebrate. So all 42,360 Israelites gathered as one and told Ezra to, to read the first five books of the scriptures to them. For six hours, they listened as the word was read to them, as the word was explained so that everybody could understand its teaching. And as the people Listen to that living and active word being spoken to them on this day of celebration. Every last one of them began to weep. They wept, not tears of joy, but sadness. As the words of the law pierced their hearts and revealed their sinful ways and painful past. They listened to all the stories where God graciously provided for them, kept his promises to them, and how they as a people continued to ignore his commands, turned to other gods, and, and did what was right in their own eyes. How painful it must have been to replay the worst parts of their history, to realize that the things didn't have to be as bad as they were. How their greatest suffering was self-inflicted. And the worst part of it all is the very sin that followed them as a curse continued to be a struggle even in this new beginning. So why is it important for us to see a bunch of people crying when they should be rejoicing? Well, these tears were just as important for Israel's future as the wall they had just finished. For Israel to return to their identity as the chosen people of God, destined to be a blessing to all nations, the walls of their hearts had to be torn down. Make no mistake, this is a holy weeping. God's word doing exactly what he sent it to do. The very purpose for which he still sends it. When was the last time that you asked for the word to be read and explained to you? When was the last time that you had six hours to spare for that purpose, even on the Lord's day. When we start getting restless after 15 minutes and start our nonverbal cues, all right, preach, let's wrap it up. 
But more to the point, as we try to live as the people of God in this day and age, people who pursue justice in our seemingly dark times, we often look outwardly at what could be done. You know, we are adept at identifying the problem in others and quick to come up with solutions. Our strength and comfort as we fight comes from whomever is sitting in office and whatever laws we can get passed. See, standing up and addressing life issues in our day and age doesn't start with building up walls of protection with laws sharpened arguments, but by asking the Word of God to come and break down the walls of our hearts, to reveal our own struggles and to remind us how dependent we are on the new beginnings that the Lord has given us, that we are sinners with a past just as painful to hear about as the headlines that we read today. We have walls that need to be knocked down and tears that need to be shed. And the word certainly affects and does that. But it doesn't stop there. See, Nehemiah, Ezra, and, and all those Levites standing up there, assisting with the teaching, all looked out at the thousands of people weeping before them. And they cried out, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved. The joy of the Lord is your strength. While the word brought weeping on this day of celebration, God's ultimate goal in sending his word to his people is rejoicing. Ezra, Nehemiah, the, the, the Levites are essentially telling the people, go, be the people God has made you to be. Go and live as the people that he has set free from slavery and restored to this place. Enjoy the blessings of the land he has returned you to. Go and share those blessings and bring everyone to the party. And most importantly, do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Not that wall you have finished. Not your ability to get this city flourishing again and in proper order again. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He delights in you and sees you as a treasured possession. His greatest joy was creating you, watching you come to life seeing you grow and develop into the person he made you to be. And most of all, restoring his relationship with you when everything seemed to fall apart. Welcoming you back into his arms. That is the joy of the Lord. Which brings us to that final scene that we need to see this morning in our gospel from Luke chapter 4. Now some Israelites have once again gathered to hear the word of God. The word being read to them. Only this time, they aren't weeping. No, as the teacher starts probing deeper and deeper into the truths of the scripture, the people run him out of the synagogue through the streets, to the edge of a cliff where they wish to see the Word made flesh die. Do you recall what happens? 
Jesus walked right through the middle of the mob and went on his way. A moment of incredible power that reminds anyone listening that no matter how bad the rejection of the word may seem, Jesus is still in complete control. He reigns. And even more, his death comes on his terms. For as Jesus went on his way that day, he wouldn't stop until he reached the cross. He was heading to the, the greatest place of rejection in order to redeem those who rejected him. Why? Because it was his joy. His joy. You know, Jesus once spoke a parable about a treasure hidden in a field. A story that we see is ultimately about himself. But he describes a man who, in his joy, gave all that he had in order to buy the field. In his joy, Jesus gave all he had to purchase you, his treasured possession. To redeem you by to redeem your life by laying down his. In Hebrews, we are exhorted to keep our eyes on Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. His joy, his cross, is your strength. As his word convicts you and reveals your failures and shortcomings, the joy of the Lord is your strength. As you live in the forgiveness that he won for you, as you live in being that people who no longer have to be burdened by your past, who no longer have to carry your guilt, but have been set free. As you wonder about your identity and significance in this world, the joy of the Lord is your strength. As you remember that he has called you by name and said you are mine in those waters of baptism. That he has made you his and you are his delight. The one he has created and loves and adores. As you weep, at the ways our world has disregarded God's gift of life. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The one who delights in his creation is always in office as he sits on his throne and rules over his creation. His joy is your strength. Now to him who is able to keep you from strump, stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.